Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you here worshiping with us at the intersection service at St. Matthew's. And for those that are visiting, I'm Brian, one of the associate pastors, and I'll be preaching on uh, Ephesians today, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 4. And so we'll have the verse on the screen behind me, and I'll read it aloud, or you can follow along in your own personal Bible. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so what we're doing with Ephesians uh, over this, this course of summertime is that we're breaking it down and looking at Paul's instruction, the church in Ephesus, on how Christian relationships and families should be structured. What are they based on? How should people relate to one another in a Christian relationship? Okay, Because in the day and age that he wrote the letter, he was competing against what society was telling Christians on how they should be in relationship and how they should interact with one another. And it was different than what God calls us to be. Kind of same for us today. Our society typically tells us, hey, this is how you should act, behave, and relate to one another, but the Bible says something totally different. And so Paul is giving instructions to his church here on how they should relate to one another. So we looked at husbands and wives when we started off, okay? The relationship between husbands and wives and a Christian relationship on how basically both groups or both people in that party there should submit to one another that the marriage comes before your own personal needs and that your marriage is based off of God. Okay? And then we looked into children okay, and how children in a Christian relationship, how they should behave, but it was more directed towards older children, adult children. Okay, It did talk about, hey, kids, obey your parents, but it also is talking about honor your father and your mother. And that is for that generation that, has, that is getting older and then they're having older parents. And how do you honor your older parents? Parents in a Christian relationship. So now, today, we're going to deal with parents, okay? And I liked Amber's children message because as parents, let's talk about it, all right? Parents, how are we to parent in a Christian way? What does that look like? And for many of us, when we think of fathers, a lot of times we think about the father or the father figure that helped raise us in childhood. Okay, When we think about father, that's, that's the, usually the first image that comes to mind. However, there's... Oh, I'm going to go to the handheld. Yep. All right, I have a three-strike rule. If it pops three times, we're switching mics. Um, and so we are going to talk about now, though, the fathers that we think about that raised us. But there's also... Um, Another group of fathers out there that may have influenced us while we grew up that we also may think of as, a, as the uh, gold standard of fathers, and that's going to probably be your favorite TV dad, okay? Y'all probably all had shows that you watched growing up, and you think back to like, what? Oh, there's a favorite TV dad that I had. And it goes way back. There's been a lot of great TV dads. And I, I started looking at the list, and man, I just had all these memories pop up of childhood of all these shows that I watched but you have Ward Cleaver, right, of Leave It to Beaver. You have Mike Brady of the Brady Bunch. Uh, Jason uh, Seaver of Growing Pains. Uh, Dan Connor of Roseanne, the rough and gruff Dan Connor. Uh, Philip Banks of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Carl Winslow of Family Matters. One of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites. Tim Taylor, Home Improvement. Man, he, that guy could not fix anything. And then, of course, that my top gold standard for me, and you got to think I'm of my generation, is Danny Tanner of Full House. Okay, you got to love some Danny Tanner, all right? But there's also um, a TV dad that's out there that you see a lot on the reruns. And a lot of times um, when I go to my in law's house, it's just on the TV in that show and it's playing that TV dad. And that TV dad is also going to be in the top probably five list for everybody, and that's going to be Andy Taylor of the Andy Griffith Show, all right? That, that guy, I mean, he's just classic, and, and reruns, go watch him. But for that show, if you think about it, it, it aired in 1960 and played eight seasons till 1968. Um, and then they had like a sequel and some other things that happened after that. But uh, the Andy Griffith Show with Andy Taylor lasted eight seasons, okay? And he had a very common sense approach to parenting and basically, you know, taking care of his town, all right? 
But what made it really interesting for the 60s was that it was really one of the first shows to have just a father and not a mother kind of raising Opie or a child, okay? And that was quite different for that day and age. A lot of shows were mothers and fathers together. Now, you had Aunt B, who was the mother figure at times, but she also had her own set of issues. But it was really a good show. And when people think about dads and your own dads, a lot of times you also think of your TV dads, you know? And if you think back and you look at how they parented, you know, they really did a lot of their parenting out of love, you know, out of love. And that's why we always think back, like, you know, that's the gold standard right there for some of those dads. But <clears throat> when we look at this passage, and it says fathers, but I also like to throw in there are some father figures out there. It may not, not all of us grew up with a biological father. It could have been an uncle, or it could have been a grandfather, it could be an adoptive parent, it could have just been somebody that uh, your family trusted, that kind of just raised you as a father would. But also this goes to just mothers as well. It's also both parents, okay? And so when we look at this passage here, okay, and fathers or parents do not provoke your children to anger, let's kind of break that down. You know, when you're, when you're parenting, sometimes your emotions get the best of you, okay? As a parent myself, there's been times where I had to go back after a parenting moment and say, after I've cooled off, I'm sorry, that came off wrong, or I'm sorry, I'm not really that mad at you. I've had to do that a few times, and I think some parents out here or parent figures have to go back and probably have done the same. Like, I'm sorry, that moment ago, that wasn't me. Let me, let's do that again. You know, I just got back. I've been out of town. It's very weird. I've been out of town for basically two weeks. I had an annual conference in Tupelo, I came back, and my daughter had a dance competition in Orlando, so I did that, and I just got back on Friday. And so when I was in Orlando, we went to Disney World. You've, you've you got to go see the mouse when you're Orlando, okay? And so we did. We went to Disney World and did the parks and all that when my daughter wasn't competing. You know, when you're at Disney World, you see some parenting uh, emotions kind of get out of control. It's really not the Disney experience until you threaten your kid that you're going to leave the park in this moment if they don't change their behavior. It's not Disney, even though you know you're not because you spent a pretty penny to be there. But you, you're, you're still going to just put that threat out there. And I saw a lot of moments of parents getting in kids' faces that finger. I'm like, there's the Disney experience. You've had it now. You're yelling at your kids at the park. But, you know, sometimes we have that, those moments as parents. But you, you, you got to think back now. When Paul wrote this letter, let's say he's writing to his church in Ephesus, what was, he, what was he trying to teach his church, okay? Why did he feel the need to say, hey, you may be seeing in your community, in this town here, some fathers, okay, heads of household parenting out of anger and provoking their children in anger, but you don't need to do that. Because in that day and age, the, the eldest or the oldest male in the household was supreme, okay, in, in Roman society. If you go back and study Roman households, the male figurehead, the oldest, was supreme, okay? It's his way or the highway. He controlled all the money. He controlled what the family did, the whole nine yards. He controlled it. He controlled it all. And a lot of times in the iron fist, the name that they would give the uh, oldest male in the family's name is called the paterna familias, which means father of the family, okay? And he took care of everything on the family's behalf, and he had absolute power. Now, he would hold that power until he would pass away, and then the next oldest male would hold the, the authority. And so Paul knew this. Paul knew this, that it was the male in that society. That's why he's, he pointed out, hey, fathers... But in our society today, it could be, hey, mothers, or hey, guardian, or whoever's taking care of the child, whoever has the authority in that house, do not provoke your children to anger. The, the father of the house, or the father of the family in Roman society had so much authority that if a child was born in that family, the child would be brought into the main commons of the home and laid there on the floor. And then the father of the family would come and inspect the child that was born. He did this for a few reasons. If there was any deformity in the child, the child would be simply put outside 
and discarded from the family. If they were not able to financially support the child, the child would be discarded literally on the streets and forgotten about. And that's how the father of the family had so much authority. So this is what Paul was writing to. So I think it's important for us to know the context of the Roman family. And Paul was speaking directly to the head of the household, whoever that may be, saying, hey, do not provoke your child in anger. And so for us in today, in today's society, okay, if you're the head of your household, especially if you're raising children, this is dealing directly with parenting children, you need to do so out of the love of Christ. As our Heavenly Father loves us, the head of the house should also love the children that they have been entrusted to, the children they are to parent, and they are to do so out of love and not to provoke in anger. Easier said than done. As I said earlier, you have your best intentions and with your children, but there's moments where your emotions get the best of you. But you need to be conscious of that. And as you raise children... You need to do so out of the spirit of love and the same love that you receive from your heavenly Father. Then it goes on to say, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Okay, so the head of the house also has a job to do, not just to get angry and provoke their child or children in anger, but they also have another job to do, that is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so when we read that, what does that mean? Brings up means to nourish, provide for, okay? So you are to nourish and provide for the instruction of the Lord and to raise your children in that. And this was a well-known concept for many followers of God of, of what parents should be doing because in Deuteronomy Chapter 11, verse 18 through 20, this is a very well-known verse, but it says in that book, you shall put these words of mine, which is the words of God, in your heart and soul. You should bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when they're at home and when they are away and when they lie down and when they rise up and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Okay, so back in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, it even instructs parents there, hey, you've got a job. You've got a job to teach your kids about God. You've got a job to remind them every day about God and to teach them. And Paul in the New Testament here is reminding his church that says you've got a job. You've got to bring your family and your children up in the words of God. You've got to teach them. Now, parents grandparents, people who look after children that are in this room, which is the vast majority of you, okay? That can be intimidating. That can be intimidating to teach your kids about God. You may feel like you don't know the right words to say or how to answer all the difficult questions, okay? Don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you. You have a resource that will help you. That is your church. You have a resource that will help you answer those questions for your children. So ask your church. Be a part of your church. You've got at least three clergy here who have gone to different seminaries, okay, but spent many years learning, okay. Ask us because we went and studied theology, the theology is the study of God. That's what the Bible is. It's a theological book. It's the study of God. Ask those questions, but don't let that stop you. Teach the children about God. Teach them. Show them what it means to be a follower of God. Because that is your job, your responsibility. Uh, last time I preached was before the 4th of July service, and I was in the sanctuary at that time. But I lifted up that in my former profession as a teacher and even when I uh, did youth ministry here and things of that nature, working with parents, a lot of times for me when I was a teacher or youth pastor, the kids were the easy part. It was parents that were difficult sometimes, okay? But the parents, a lot of times when I taught, felt they can take their kids and put them on the bus or drop them off at school and school's going to teach them everything they need to know about life and mom and dad didn't have to do any of that. 
the school would teach them how to balance a checkbook. The school would teach them how to apply for a loan and how to do health insurance, right? And the school would teach them what the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do is and da da da. No, the school's going to teach you just the academic stuff, okay? The teacher, I was a history teacher. I wasn't teaching your kid about uh, mortgages, no. I'm going to teach you what's in the history book. Yeah, I'm going to teach you about the Revolutionary War and industrialization and, you know, the Great Depression, all that, all that stuff. That's what I'm going to teach you about. That's your job as mom and dad, though, around the dinner table or when you're in car driving between activities or on the weekends or what. That's your job to teach your kids. And then the same thing with youth ministry. They thought they could send their kid to this one retreat and they're going to be saved and the perfect disciple the rest of their life. No. They may have a great experience and learn and may commit themselves to Christ. Great. But mom and dad, they're going to need you. They're going to need you at home to teach them about God. The, the, the youth pastor will do it as well. But there's a statistic out there that says it takes a roughly seven Christian people to pour into one child. One child needs seven Christian people in their life. That could be their pastor, their student pastor, a small group leader. But that's only three. Mom and dad need to be a part of that seven. Okay? And some other trusted individuals need to be a part of that seven. Okay? And so for parents, you can send them to great churches. You can send them to great schools. And they'll, be, they'll, they'll have a leg up on a lot of folks. But they still need mom and dad. They still need mom and dad to teach them things in life. You know? Now, parents, don't get me wrong. They may not want to take your teachings, okay? But that doesn't mean you don't do it, all right? Because there will be a time when they're older that they would appreciate what you taught them. And, and religion and God is one of those. And so Paul is telling these fathers or heads of household that you bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I understand we all get busy. We all get busy in life. And mom and dads have to work. Or mom and dads volunteer. And mom and dads have responsibilities. Mom and dads have older parents. Yeah, we understand all that. And so it is hard to make time to teach your children. You know, it's easy to say, well, I've got too much going on or I'm unsure how to do it, we just won't get to it today. And then it won't be until next week, and then it will be until next month, and then it may be just we'll mention it a few times a year at Christmas and Easter in the house, and then that's it. You know, it is, I, I sympathize with that. I understand that there's many times at the end of the day my brain is done. I want to go get in the bed, read my whatever I read on my phone that I probably don't need to read anyway and go to sleep. You know, but it does take time and energy that we do need to be involved in our kids' lives. It is always good to not have something planned for the day and just to spend it with your kids. You know, I always have this anxiety sometimes like, oh gosh, we don't have anything scheduled today. I feel weird about that. I feel like I need to be doing something. I feel weird just sitting down for just a second with the kids. I feel like we've got to be somewhere. It's okay. Because we are called to be a part of our kids' lives, and to instruct and to teach them. And so when we do that, we do that with the mindset of the love of God. Okay? With the love of God. Now, your kids are always going to do things that you don't like, and they will need correcting, and that is your role as a parent. But when you do that, do it as the Father corrects you, as our Heavenly Father corrects us. And remember that our Heavenly Father gives us grace for when we repent and where we understand where we have messed up and where we have done things in sin our heavenly father still gives us the gift of repentance of the ability to turn away from that and to turn back to him and to receive forgiveness and we grow from that we grow from that and so we too should give our kids grace as they grow as well it's important and we see that grace given to us. We feel that grace given to us when we do things like we're going to do in a minute as taking communion, as partaking in the sacrament. In that moment there, Jesus in his final moments felt that it was so important that he have this meal and that he shared that time with his disciples 
and said, do this, repeat this in remembrance of me. We do that remembering his sacrifice for us and we're also remembering the gift that Jesus gave us of being reunited with our God through the cross. That sin will no longer separate us. That we can be connected to our Heavenly Father again. And so in this moment, as I wrap up my sermon, I, I, lifting up love and lifting up grace and communion, I, I have to share something that's been on my heart. As I said, I've been out of town for the past two weeks. One week was with annual conference, and the other week I was on a personal trip for my daughter. And typically when I'm on a personal trip, and I encourage you to do the same, you, you try to disconnect a little bit, right? You try to spend your time in that moment of your vacation or whatever. But your pastors never truly can disconnect, okay? And that's part of, that's part of the calling. However, though, it, my, heart was, my heart was sad. My heart was sad because I know our church has had a rough couple of weeks, it really has. And as I tried to disconnect, I still could hear and see and, and, and know the difficulties that we've been going through. And so in this moment, as we, we look at God's love for us, as we, as we take communion, I want to lift up that the greatest commandments that God gave us was, number one, to love your God and then number two, love your neighbor. And so I want to lift up that we need to remember that we need to love our God. And we need to love our neighbor. And this has been a difficult time and season for this local church. But coming from annual conference, it's also been a difficult season for many churches as well. We are not unique in the moment that we find ourselves in. But as your pastors, one of your pastors, I want to just remind us that that we are giving grace by an amazing God. We're giving love by an amazing God. And that we are also called to do the same for our neighbors. And so for our church members here who find themselves on different sides of opinion on the issues at hand, may we remember as we receive God's love that we are still to call to love each other, even though we don't agree on everything. And that's just what we're called to do. And in life, as many of us know, we're not always going to agree on everything. You're not going to find two people that agree on every single issue in life. But the one thing that binds us all is love. And so today, I really want us to, yes, to, to hear what Paul has to say for our parents. But also, as we take communion, I want us to take away from this service in this moment on how much you're loved by God. And there's nothing you can do that can turn away his love from you. But yet, as we take communion, we're also to love our neighbors wherever they are in their life as well. So I want to lift that up. And as your pastor, I am extremely blessed to be here at this church. I pray for this church every day that they are listening to the call that God has placed on their heart and that they can feel the love of God and share the love of God. So as we gather together here, we will take communion and we'll be a part of that experience of love and grace. The communion table in this church is an open communion table, which growing up, I grew up United Methodist. I always thought the table was always open until I went to a Catholic church with my friend and I will admit my sin. I took Catholic communion because I thought it was open to everybody. And he just looked at me and was like, no, you're not supposed to do that. you got to put your arms across your chest. And I was like, what's the deal? Anyway, this is an open table, okay, in this church. It's not my table. It's not St. Matthew's or the United Methodist Church. It is God's table. And he invites every single person, wherever they are in their life, to his table if they want to come. It's their choice to come to the table. And so today we're going to take communion. And all are welcome that want to receive the love and grace of Jesus.